We are live. So welcome to our one o'clock talk. We are here with Wolfgang Gorlick and are in him talking on design thinking for blue teams. Wolf, I'll hand it to you. Hey, thanks so much. And thanks everyone for uh, for coming, for joining. I really enjoy Converge every year that I've uh, been able to attend. So this uh, virtual format, you know, it's, it's a little different, but it feels good, of course, to at least be together in, in this way. So as already mentioned, I'm Wolfgang Gorlick. Uh, I'm an advisory CISO at, uh, at Duo, uh, formerly was at financial services and in healthcare. And, uh, and I like to say I fight for the user, right? I, like Tron, I fight for the user. I like that. It sounds, it sounds good. It sounds bold. It sounds strong. Uh, but the reality is, the reality is what I want to talk about today is I've realized I've spent about 10 years solving the wrong problem. And, uh, and that has resulted in more than a few uh, presentations uh, at Converge, which, which we'll cover. Um, but the beginning, you know, in security, you're like, ah, it's, it's cool. Um, we just, we need to harden the technology. We need to build a nice castle around our systems and our apps, and, and we'll be good. We'll be fine. Um, no problem. <laughs> Until you start really looking at defense in depth and, and recognizing just how many ways things can go wrong. And, and recognize that every time you put in place a technology or a control in some place, the user ignores it or works around you. Uh, we, we've got really hardened devices, right? We've given the user really hardened devices. Awesome. What are they doing? Well, they, they bought consumer tech and they're sending everything through Gmail and Dropbox to their apps so they can get their job done. Those sort of things. And it, even if we could build a castle around uh, security today, which I argue we can't uh, because Typical organization is running thousands of apps. I'll talk to a CISO and say, hey, man, are you, how, how many are you securing? Be like, 50, <laughs> 10? Right? It's, it's oftentimes a great delta between what we're able to secure and what we're not. Um, uh, what about devices? How many devices do you have? Well, let's figure all our users have two, and we've got uh, 10,000 users, so we got about 20,000 devices. Uh, true story, we just went through... Uh, deploying a tech, you know, technology and, and building an inventory for an organization, and they found 30,000 devices, 30,000 devices they weren't aware of. So even if we could build a castle and somehow wrap it around all these devices and apps that we're not aware of, that we're not tracking, that was falling through the cracks, do um, you ever look at how long it took to build a castle? It's like 25 years. It took 20% of the revenue of a kingdom. So I can imagine sitting down right with, with our boss and going, all right, I will solve your security problem. I just need two decades. <laughs> it's not happening. So then I'm, I realized, okay, the challenge is, and as an industry, we, we got to this point. The challenge is we're not speaking the language of the business. We will speak the language of the business. Risk. I gave a talk for B-Sides Detroit, one of the, the early years of B-Sides Detroit, called Naked Boulder Rolling, where I talked all about speaking about risk and what worked and what didn't. And how we're structuring it, and and even at that point in time, there there were starting to show the gray areas, right? We, we would put in place a risk program, and uh, and I talked to executives, and their eyes would glaze over almost as much as when I was telling them about how I was configuring the domain controller and locking down the SQL server. I'm like, hey, hey, come on, this is math, this is math and fair. It's really good. And like, uh, yeah. <laughs> what we ended up with was. Um, was effectively cheeseburger risk management. You tell people again and again and again what to do. Don't eat a cheeseburger, they're bad for you. Uh, but again and again and again, cheeseburgers are tasty. There's a lot of benefit to a cheeseburger. I will have a cheeseburger. Uh, until you have a heart attack, until you get breached, and then we discover religion, we lock everything down, we adopt healthy food habits, and cheeseburgers start looking pretty tasty again. So we know that risk management is, is struggling. It's struggling, uh, and uh, I, I feel the same way uh, just with this pandemic, right? So uh, it really dawned on me what it was like to be the CFO I was reporting up to, uh, to see the numbers, because I look at the numbers every day in Michigan. I'm like, well, I really shouldn't go out uh, because the numbers are here, but I really need a haircut, but I really shouldn't go out. Now the numbers are here, but I'm like, you know what? It's probably fine to get a haircut at this point in time. Right, even though it's 10 times above where it was where I said I would never, ever get a haircut. Because you get habituated and you start to ignore all these signals. So psychologically, risk management doesn't, doesn't work well. 
Um, and then I was like, all right, no problem. I know the problem. I've, I've got it. Culture. Culture. If we just tell people what they need to do, they'll do it. Simple as that. How do we just share the security knowledge? What, what do we need to do? Uh, ignoring, ignoring years of evidence. Back to cheeseburgers. Back to seatbelts. Uh, back to any, you name any appropriate security behavior in the lives of Americans that we just like ignore, even though we've got all the knowledge. And this isn't, uh, this isn't something that people aren't aware of. Lots of studies have shown, hey, even if folks are, uh, uh, let me give you an example. Last pass to the study, and they found that folks knew that they needed to do MFA, and folks knew you had to do a complex password, right? 70% of the people said that they knew that these things were a thing. And then last pass said, how many of you are doing them? And that number went, because <laughs> awareness doesn't translate to action. It's very frustrating. And I was looking at this, especially with this being voting time, right? November, December. I was looking at uh, some of the work that Todd Rogers did. Todd Rogers, check out his TED Talk if you want. Uh, he went ahead and looked at just the thing. What does awareness do for voting? Come, pick up the phone and say, hey, do you know you should vote? Do, the, do people show up? Turns out they don't. Awareness does nothing. If you back awareness up with calls for a plan, what's your plan to vote? If you back awareness up for with peer pressure or tied to their identity, suddenly they do the right thing. And uh, it in seeing this talk, a big light bulb went off over my head because I realized some of the successes we've seen in, in DevSecOps and in rugged DevOps uh, have this exact thing. We don't tell them, hey, do you know there's the OS top 10? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, we say, hey, what's your plan for addressing these vulnerabilities? Hey, your identity is a craftsman a person who produces quality code, resilient code, secure code, usable code. Um, how can we help you with that, right? We, we don't do awareness with, that doesn't work. We know that um, in much the same way, there are certain things that will drive behaviors whether you're voting or you're coding. So all this is to say back to fighting for the users. I'm sure you've seen this comic, everyone has, it's all over the place, it's Dave, right? Dave. What are you doing, Dave? I, I thought we built you the right system, Dave. Why are you why are you uh, running with password with an ampersand? Why why are you not doing MFA? Why have you not patched your system in, in six years? Why are you using Gmail to dump all the files? Ah, uh, Dave, Dave. But the reality is, <laughs> the reality is there's a lot that we need to do. Uh, to make it better for Dave. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Also, I'm going to ask for a couple things. Um, throughout this talk, of course, if you've got questions, throw them in chat. We'll have time afterwards. Feel free to reach me on Twitter. Um, but I'm going to ask for a couple of very specific things to move this idea forward. One of the first one is, if you've got a super Dave story, right? Dave the user, um, save the day. Dave the user, notice the problem. Dave the user is, is a champion in his business area, configuring IT, writing code, uh, as a salesperson, as someone in finance. Dave is amazing. I would love to hear your Dave stories. <laughs> so please do hit me up with those. I'm trying to get a sense of what it takes to, to have users adopt good security practices. All right, let's talk about what I think the actual problem is. And then we're not gonna throw in the white flag. We're not gonna give up just yet. 2020 Wolf says that uh, 2015 Wolf was full of it. The real problem is intentionally or accidentally we're creating experiences. Every time we put in place technology, every time we put in place a control, we're putting in place an experience. If, let's imagine, you are a SaaS funder. Oof, okay, you're a SaaS funder. Uh, you're going to make all the money. And you create you create the setup that's, that's fantastic, right? Uh, it, uh, it walks the user through. It's very simple. It calls them and verifies a couple of information. It's awesome. And you notice your numbers go way up. Right, you created a good experience, low friction. They love it. Uh, that same experience, though, which you might not realize, is you've created an experience for the adversary. Let's suppose we have someone who's doing phone scams. They've got a bank of nine hundred numbers, and they use an API because you're not rate limiting. You're checking this to register ten thousand accounts on your your SaaS app. And ten thousand times you call those nine hundred numbers, and now they are effectively getting money out of you uh, and potentially money laundering. So 
did we create that experience intentionally? No, we absolutely did not. Did we do it accidentally? Yes. Because these paths that we create for our users, these same stones, these same stepping points, are the paths we're creating for the attackers. So what makes, what makes a path? How can we delve into the psychology uh, of the path the user is taking or the adversary is taking? Well, the first thing is uh, the paths they take. And then the second thing is the choices they're making along those paths, right? Um, the paths they take to, to log in and get access to um, an EHR, right? The choices they make in terms of um, this configuration or that configuration. If you're a red team or the choice you make in terms of, do I exploit this vulnerability or that vulnerability? And there's certain properties that we can play with to make things better or worse. In terms of the paths, it's things like the number of steps. Obviously, fewer are, are better, uh, more are worse if you're trying to get people to follow your path. The, the familiarity of each step. So um, I say all the time, right, when work looks like work, work gets done. If you're familiar with it and it's what you do every day, poof, no problem. If I'm logging in and uh, I'm doing multi-factor to get at my app, awesome. If I don't have to log into VPN, I've got to update it and I don't do that very often, or if there's a different authenticator I need to use, suddenly it's not very familiar. And it's those unfamiliar areas that oftentimes people will no bound of uh, friction, friction at each step. Now, interesting friction's really interesting uh, because you think, well, no friction is good. But if you think of like Bruce Schneier's concept about security theater, uh, people also in the workforce want to feel secure. There's this really interesting study of um, security techniques. This is again multi-factor because that's what I, I tend to focus in on right now, but. They were, they were comparing different ways of authenticating. And they rated the ones with just enough friction as the more secure ones, right? If you got to stand in line and you got someone, you know, wiping you down, like, um, okay, that feels secure. If you just walk in, it, like, wait, where's the security? So friction is very interesting. You don't want it too much, but you also don't want none because you want people to feel secure and feel like you're doing the right thing. From the choices, things like the number of choices, the predictability of choices. The predictability is an area I love to play with when I'm creating an adversarial architecture. When I'm designing something that will mess with the red team, I want to mess with predictability. Because you think, all right, I go down this path every single day and it's always open, everything's fine, I get to work, uh, no problem. Suddenly there's construction that's unpredictable, you're late, you get frustrated, right? Think about that frustration. In much the same way, pen tests are like, here's my path to DA, here's my path to DA, here's my path to DA. If suddenly you mess with the predictability of that, um, tools in this environment uh, get automatically erased. Uh, malware that would work uh, ordinarily does not work because I'm running a different system uh, or I'm doing application whitelisting. Right? Predictability is a really interesting thing to play with. Uh, and finally, the cognitive load. How much energy does it take for me to figure out what to decide? When we think about the path that we're playing with, these are the properties that uh, we want to be thinking about when we're laying down tech. And again, this can be in a number of different ways, right? People who are gaining access to applications, people who are doing privileged access management. What are the, the steps that you ask your admins to go through uh, so they can make a change on the PCI servers? We ever sat down and looked at that? It's a painful process that we make uh, make people go through. Ugh. So when troubleshooting and when working on this, uh, there's there's two frameworks I want to share. Uh, one is the four Bs, and the other is the or three Bs, and one is the four Is. So starting with the Bs from from a behavior perspective, this actually comes from a rationality labs. And Irrationality Labs divides things up into these three areas, right? We got the behavior we want them to do. We want them to choose a good password. We want them to not click on, um, on phishing emails. We want them to patch their systems. Uh, we want them to actually use the, the PAM setup we've done, not work around it because it takes too long. Uh, we got the behavior that we want. And we got the barriers to that behavior. Um, how many steps there are, how much cognitive load there is, how much friction there is, right? Uh, all those sort of things. And then finally, we get the benefits. And benefits is, is one that is, is tricky, right? Because what is the benefit of security? Uh, you're protecting the organization, good. Um, you're, you're protecting 
the technology, great. Um, what benefit do you bring? Oftentimes our benefits are, if you talk to a lot of companies, even success stories, they're like, oh yeah, our, our benefit is we reduced um, the work that the security team was performing and doing, you're like, wait a minute, what? And you you peel it behind and it's like, oh, you've got all the users away, right? We, we, we gave them MFA, so now we don't require a, a password rotation. Um, we consolidated a workflow, so now we're doing single sign-on so they can get to their apps quicker. Um, you know, we, we deployed SailPoint and identity access management, and we're doing access certifications. And now it's easier for them to get in, and there's not as many clicks to, to go ahead and say, yep, that's what my people should have. So oftentimes our benefit statements and security is, we're going to know you less. That's uh, that's where we're at. I think this gets back to why I need Super Day of Stories, because I'm sure there's more in benefits that we can be looking at. On the barrier side, um, we want to reduce barriers and we want to clarify those behaviors. And uh, when we reduce barriers, we want to like start troubleshooting it and bucketing it up. We can use this thing called the four eyes framework. This comes from Fernando Montenegro, converged Detroit a few years back at uh, Kobo, now TCF. Uh, and, and Fernando pointed out this framework. And I think it works really well for barriers. There's ignorance. Uh, We'll just tell them what to do. No, not not the security awareness, but also if if it is a familiarity thing, if it is a knowledge thing, uh, we can make it a little bit easier for them to understand what's going on. We can give better prompts, better training. Uh, we can better equip the help desk to, uh, you know, discuss what has to happen on devices, those sort of things. So very important. I don't say you know ignorance is you just tell them what to do. But you do give them the information so they can follow the path. And that will increase compliance. Uh, if it's a rationality, a rationality is an interesting one, right? It's always it's always rational when we do it. It's irrational when they uh, don't. How oftentimes do we think, well, the users just they click anything, right? Irrationality. Uh, so certainly it is understanding the psychology of people. Why are people doing what they're doing? What can we do to nudge them in the right behaviors? Uh, what can we do to give them smarter defaults? Those sort of things. But it also is a rationality in the security team itself. I'll give you a good example. Um, they're um, with COVID, obviously, doctors are very busy. There's a lot of strains in our healthcare system right now. And uh, one thing that has long happened in the American healthcare system is doctors will be you know, working with several different provider groups. So doctors may work with three or four different hospital systems. Uh, they're using their own devices oftentimes. Resources are short. You don't want to carry around four devices with you. That makes sense. So what happens? All right, we will go ahead and we'll deploy, if I was a hospital system, I will deploy an MDM on your device to control it. That makes sense, sort of, right? As we are the security experts and we shall, because that's what you do for endpoint security. Tell me what you do. Uh, however, imagine you're for that physician. Now you got one, two, three, four, perhaps more uh, MDM agents on your phone, conflicting with each other, right? Different requirements, uh, giving you error messages. In some cases, you know, really making your phone unusable. Uh, is that is that a rationality of the the physician who's trying to do the work, or is that a rationality of the security team who is asking something unrealistic? I would argue the later. So we need to, to get to those roots and, and iterate the design. Uh, investment. Investment is a good one, right? Um, are we asking something that there just simply isn't enough people to do? Uh, are we asking something that uh, there isn't enough technology or they don't have the right technology? There was a, a case on a encode decode podcast a while back where I was interviewing a CISO. And his problem was, uh, when the organization was hiring, they were just asking, hey, you know, like snap a photo of your ID and, and email it to me and we'll, we'll figure it out from there. Oh, by the way, just email or text in your, your account information, we'll enter it. <laughs> He's like, you're doing what? That's all clear text, what are you doing? And in identifying the barriers with the um, you know chief people officer, it was the HR system. They, they didn't have investment to get an HRMS that would do this all online in a secure way. So they partnered, got investment, removed that barrier, and uh, the HR person's happy and the security person's happy, right? Investment. And, and finally, incentives. And I don't mean incentives like in, in the benefit way. 
like maybe we do a, a drawing or a lottery if you if you report fishes fast or you know the the people who do the the most uh, uh, access certifications and not like that uh, although they certainly could uh, what we want to pay attention to in terms of a barrier to security here is incentives not being lined up correctly so good example identity access management um, I'm a manager right <laughs> of of my team. And, uh, and I need to make sure that my people have the right access. So, uh, you know, a company like Uber Ether is, deploys a technology like SailPoint, and they say, look, um, Mr. Manager, will you please go to this access certification page and, and, you know, fill out that, yes, you're doing the right things and certify that your people have the right access. This is one of the hardest things to get managers to do. And the reason is the incentives aren't lined up. Right? My incentives are to, to meet my goals, to keep my boss happy, to keep my team happy, all sorts of things. Very, very low on, that, on the priority list with almost no incentive whatsoever. Is there a little line item that says, talk to the identity access management team and complete your certifications. Um, incentives, the alignment or misalignment is oftentimes in the barrier. So, once we identify those barriers, we can start looking at the benefits. Uh, again, it could be simply as we're getting out of your way. Uh, we have deployed a password manager, and now we're, you can have 64 character passwords and not have to worry about it. The benefit is we're gotten out of your way. There are sometimes some situations where you can actually have a benefit that uh, is just because the technology seems cool or appealing to the user. And if I go back to like some of the, the earliest security, right, and some of the earliest technology, uh, I'm thinking about like the 1920s. I'm thinking about planes, early pilots, and they would fly up. And some of the security gear they had was some additional seatbelts and helmets, safety goggles. But the safety goggles would fog up. The safety goggles would fog up. Uh, there was glare coming in depending on the angle of ascent. And uh, this was leading to pilot error, and this was leading to planes crashing. You can't have that. So, um, you know, the, the U.S. gets involved, the U.S. military gets involved, Bausch and Lam won the contract, and in partnership with uh, uh, Colonel McCready, uh, they come out with Ray-Bans, Ray-Ban aviators, right? Ray-Ban aviators. So the pilots are wearing them, pilots can see, it doesn't get fogged, it, it takes care of the glare. They're effectively cool-looking safety glasses. And they would only get more cool. Because pilots back then were really cool. Movie stars always are cool. Uh, James Dean, Audrey Hepburn in the 50s start wearing them. So everyone wants them now, right? Um, Top Gun happens in the 1980s, and now pilots are really cool with their Ray-Bans. Um, and Maverick's coming back. Side note, can't wait for that movie. Um, <laughs> that's going to be fun. But so Ray-Bans everywhere. So in 1999, Luxottica. Luxottica is the the like uh, luxury brand for glasses. Luxottica buys Ray-Bans and headings everywhere, headlines everywhere read, Luxottica buys 1970 year old safety goggles. No, no, no one said that. No one thought that, right? No one thought of them as safety goggles. They were just something cool. In much the same way, we can find ways that our technology becomes cool. The controls become cool. Uh, my favorite example of this was Privileged access management, um, and the the admins were logging in. There's a million one steps, and it was complicated, and you had to go through a session broker into a jump server. And so instead, they worked with the security team worked with one of the IT admins uh, as their champion, and they came up with this really cool, overpowered, awesome workstation. And they loaded all the tools on it, and uh, and all the admins wanted it. It was great. And of course, it was safety goggles, right? It was a privilege access workstation that could only run certain tools, it was heavily locked down, uh, but it was very powerful and very, very easy to use to get in. And because only the, the cool admins, right, the, the ones with the most power got it, it very quickly became a status symbol, which was an intrinsic benefit to rolling out that technology. We need to think about those things. We don't, we usually don't. Um, and we also need to realize that, you know, metrics and these sort of things can be very tricky. It's very easy for them to go wrong. So if you've been in Michigan for the past couple of years, I'm sure you've seen the signs of X number of traffic deaths in Michigan per year. 
Seemed like a great idea. Seems like a very security idea. I will give a metric and people will do the right thing. <laughs> you you have uh, 10,000 vulnerabilities in your uh, sphere of influence, right? In your business unit that you're managing IT. One of 13 different business units. Okay, all right. I shall now refix them. No, you're not. The first thing you're gonna say is, well, how much does everyone else have? And if you find they're all around 10,000, you're gonna go like, huh, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm right there with my peers, right? Peer pressure, no problem, no pressure. Everything's good. I'm not gonna fix it. I'm gonna ignore the security guy. Um, not that this hasn't happened to everyone ever trying to run a vulnerability management program. We saw the exact same thing happen when they started putting up posters with how many deaths in a, a two-year research study just hit, just hit, and I said, psychologically, what people did was they went, oh, I'm gonna readjust my risk, and they actually saw an increase in traffic deaths. People are weird. <laughs> so we also have to think about how these things might fail. It can fail in a variety of different ways, right? Backfiring was what I just mentioned. Uh, people can nope out. Uh, the other thing is uh, treatment offset by later behavior. Good example of that was rolled out uh, multi-factor in a university. This was actually reported in the MySec Slack. So MySec Slack says, oh, by the way, um, we've got multi-factor, oh, that's cool. And we've got adjunct professors, oh, that's cool. And the adjunct professor in question is sharing out his app with his students. That's not cool. And he goes, yeah, so because they trust the multi-factor, the adjunct has written his password on the board and just, you know, Approve, approve, approve to let people in. Ah, treatment offset by later behavior. There's a number of different ways these things can fail. So when thinking about behaviors, um, we want to identify the barriers and remove them. We want to amplify the benefits, and we want to have in place a, a you know reflection period to catch these types of failures and adjust how we're approaching things. Uh, a quote from the New School of Information Security has stuck with me for many years. This is Adam Shostak. He said, amateurs study cryptography, professionals study economics. It stuck out with me for a couple of reasons. One, I'm not good at crypto anymore. <laughs> Too much math, I don't wanna do it. Secondly, is that, that focus on economics, that focus on why people do what they do, I think is so incredibly important. So with the apologies to Adam Shostak, I would amend this to say that professionals study behavior economics. What is the behaviors and the psychology that lead people to make certain decisions? And how can we nudge them towards more secure decisions? How can we create experiences that lead to more secure behaviors? Behavior economics. So with apologies to Adam Shostak, uh, but he stole it from General Barrow. So, you know, if Shostak can steal from a general, I can steal from Shostak. That's my stance and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Another call here for help. Um, if you are a student in organizational psych, if you're a student in behavior economics, if you're working on a thesis, if you're working on a capstone project, if you want to tackle something interesting, this is a rife area for innovation. So reach out to me. I'd be happy to be an advisor or help any way I can. Got a lot of research for students on what, uh, what constitutes good secure behavior. But my point is, is that when we think about the bricks that we've laid to create the path of the user, we need to, in conjunction with IT, spend more time looking at those and figure out ways that we can reduce the friction, uh, that we can reduce the choices, and cause a better system to, to emerge. One way to do that is design thinking. So design thinking is has been talked about a lot as of late, um, past maybe five years or so, it's, it's kind of going through the hype cycle. Uh, but fundamentally, it traces back to really the beginning of computing. Uh, this bad boy is one of the first mice. This is Doug Engelbert's mouse. He didn't actually make it. He had a friend who was a mechanical engineer who put it together. But Doug Engelbart was the guy who um, did the mother of all uh, demos and really saw the potential for computers to augment the human intellect. Now, here we find the prototype. And one of the things about Doug Engelbart is his mental model was we're teaching people to play the computer. He thought about it very much like a musical instrument. We're teaching people to play the computer. 
And uh, therefore, you notice this input <laughs> device uh, next to the mouse is a cord, right? The idea was you would have certain hotkeys on that to open up menus or or cause actions. And mind you, this was the 1960s, right? Opening up menus itself was amazing. What do you mean you could tile something? Ah, simpler times. Uh, passwords. Passwords are still clear text. Simpler times. So the interesting thing about Ungabar is because he viewed it as a musical instrument, to learn to play the mouse, to learn to play the computer, uh, was a six-month course back then. Enter Xerox a couple years later, um, and Xerox realized that you know the mouse is, is pretty cool. But their mental model was precision instrument. So they had these devices built. You can see it's got a steel trackball. It's got multiple mounting screws. And what was fascinating about this thing, what I loved about the story of this, is that a team of engineers every week, at the end of every week, go mouse to mouse, disassemble it, clean it, reassemble it, Align it, right? Precision instrument. So that, of course, wasn't going to fly for Apple. And Apple gets a lot of the credit for being uh, being the you know person or the organization that brought the mouse to people. And I admit that the one on the, the left, right, the original mouse, I think that was the first mouse I ever used in grade school. But behind this story was actually a guy named David Kelly. And David Kelly went on to be one of the founders of IDEO. David Kelly builds his team, and uh, David Kelly is like, all right, I'm just going to sit with users. I'm going to sit with normal people. I'm going to sit with kids. I'm going to figure out how the, the thing goes together. I'm going to figure out, what, does the click sound good or not? I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some empathy and just sit with the problem and figure out what to, to do. And as you guys know, of course, that, that mouse is – now the, the common standard and evolved over many generations. But IDEO was the one who developed this idea of design thinking. It's several stages. It starts with empathize. It really starts with figure out what the person does and needs. And I want to contrast that um, with how we build systems. So we don't oftentimes start with empathy. Uh, this poster, by the way, is, is hanging in my office. It's a great reminder. It's like right over there. It's a great reminder for me to, to keep focused on these ideas because I come out of the ITIL school, right? I come out of the like IT way of thinking. And it, the ITIL process does not start with empathy. It's we want to have a service catalog. We want to have SLA and figure out our availability and continuity. We want to include security. Thank you, ITIL. Include <laughs> security and make sure the technologies. And then we want to figure out our supply chain. Nowhere in there is the people using this, right? This is very much an IT-centric approach. It's very much the Doug Engelbart approach. This is very much the Xerox approach. By contrast, Dave Kelly and his mouse, the mouse that became the Apple mouse, uh, much, much different. Cheaper, easier to use. Xerox costs around 400 which is around 1200 in today's money. The Apple mouse costs 25 which is around 75 in today's money. Curiously enough, Apple mouse has not change price-wise with inflation. That's fascinating, but it's a story for another day. Uh, six months training in Thingabart, no way. Six minutes was what uh, Steve Jobs would uh, you know, tell. People could sit down on this computer in minutes, use it. Six minutes. Design thinking. And it really starts with that empathy part, something we don't oftentimes focus in on. So usually I think security starts something like this, right? There's a, there's a developer and they're like, hey, you know, I'm going to take a walk around the building uh, before we do our sprint planning. And a teammate's like, yeah, that, that's a good idea. But, you know, this is Michigan and it, it is supposed to rain, so be careful. And security will jump up, right? I've got this. I've got you. I've got you. I heard you. Don't want it to get wet. Also, someone could drop stuff on your head. That's not good. And what happens if the wind carries away? That would be bad. And next thing you know, the developer ends up with an umbrella like this, and this is this is security. This is this is the fundamental problem why developers, in particular, stay away from security. Uh, this, by the way, this umbrella is from the uncomfortable. This uncomfortable also is featured in some of my slide transitions. Really great uh, example of uh, difficult to use designs. So, how do we create that user empathy? Well. You know, it begins with a security team and trying to get to the business me. 
Um, and that could be a developer, like I was just talking about. It could be your IT person. It could be the person who's responsible for doing your access certifications in IAM. Uh, it could be someone in finance who just want to use MFA. It could be the doctor I mentioned who's walking around to four different clinics trying to deliver patient health care uh, and being asked too much of their devices. So we don't usually know what they need, right? We're the experts. We're the experts. And that's how they end up with stone umbrellas. <laughs> so we've thought about this problem for a while. And security champions is oftentimes the way that it's explained. We need someone from that business function to champion security. And someone from that business function to explain to the rest of the team why security is important. And there's a lot of great research on security champions. There's a lot of great presentations on security champions. Uh, she hacks purple. If you're if you want to do a Google, they've got some great uh, training on how to do this in the dev world. Lots of good stuff about champions. But it really still isn't very empathetic when you think about it. We want someone in the business team to tell the person what to do. No, you really should use the stone umbrella. I know it's heavy, but no, no. I would argue we need one additional thing. And this isn't talked about enough, although some organizations are doing it. And that is a security advocate. So security advocate sits in the security function. They understand security. Um, they have a relationship, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the security champion. Um, but... The advocate's job is to understand the barriers. The advocate's job is to understand the benefits. The advocate's job is to go back to us in security and go, really, dude, concrete umbrella. How are you going to carry that? <laughs> have, you, have you ever tried to walk around the You know what I mean? The role of the advocate and champion is to collaborate to remove as much security as possible and just leave the controls that are actually necessary. There's been some good research. If you if you check out Soups, there's a, a paper recently on uh, security advocates and, and what makes a good one and, and how they work. So check that out. We start with understanding the path that people take. Uh, this is a DevOps path, but you could, you could do a journey map. You could do a service map. You basically want to map out the path that people are taking. And along that way, you want to look for each one of those bricks, each one of those steps, and figure out how we can reduce friction and barriers. If we don't do this, we know what people do. Uh, either they nope out, <laughs> they just, we will ignore that control until someone, and not just, not just non-technical people do this. It's not just Dave, uh, an MDM was recently being rolled out and I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna wait to the very last minute. Maybe they forgot about me. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll just fly on, right? We, people do that. You, you know about. The other thing that's even more risky is creative constraints theory says the more constraints we put on something, the more creative they are. And the other thing that is very concerning to me, and one of the security incidents I was directly involved with in the past couple of years uh, stemmed out just this issue. Uh, if we put too many controls in the way, in this case, it was a very complicated um a uh, multi-factor process onto a broken VPN, trying to get files that were only available on the secure server. If we put too many constraints in place, what do people do? They work around them. And then my team just went, oh, we could just copy those files onto our own system, thereby creating an issue. That's not only you know, a, a one-off. That is probably the predominant driver of security issues going into the 2020 to 2030. Users... Being creative, working around security, not involving security, causing bigger issues. One of two concerns we have. So how do we create adversary empathy? And I don't mean like, let's put our hand around the, the criminals and, and hang out with them a bit. No, but I, I need better understand what they're doing. See, the, the concept of design thinking from a defensibility perspective is to use these human-centered design ideas to make inhumane nightmares for red teams, for criminals, for adversaries, by adding steps, by adding confusion, right? By adding cognitive load. So we can map out the path that they're gonna take to the environment. And there's, there's lots of things that we've done in my sec and lots of previous conversations we've had about how to do attack path mapping, 
um, how to, to do threat modeling. So there's a, a good body of knowledge that we can rely on, as well as um, just looking at some of the data that's coming out from Verizon Data Breach Report and others that really shows what impact this can have. You can see um, as you add more steps, the success of the attack goes down. Add enough, it drops to zero. If you want to, to know more about threat modeling, check out the threat modeling manifesto that was released in the past few, uh, few weeks. Well worth looking, it aligns very well with what I found in doing threat modeling and doing security exercises. So where, where do we do this? One thing is um, there, there's an idea that's prevalent in a lot of blue teams, that to, um, to do your job, you've got to get a, a outside view, right? We gotta have a broader view. Um, to, to really be able to, to do what I need to do, um, I need to, to have a lot of threat intelligence feeds. Possibly, yes. Uh, but also, the reality is, is with good introspection and, and mature programs, we've got a lot of intel right in our program, right? We've got a lot of intel right in our four walls from pen tests, um, from internal reports, and and from looking at security incidents. So what happened when they went after us? How did that work? Can we threat model that? Can we see where uh, we were not adding friction? Can we see where we got gaps in visibility and, and where we don't have barriers? So it starts at looking inside our organizations and really having a mature IR function and a mature forensics function. So we can say, how are these things happening? And once we know how they're happening, let's do that attack path. Let's look at those barriers and, and amp up things in the right way. But also, since we're paying attention to the user, amp up things that will stop the adversary but not affect them, right? There's a whole bunch of controls that we can do that are completely invisible to the to the user. And once we have both those paths, we can begin to make those decisions. So then the blue team can go ahead and, and do what they need to do. Now, um, what I'm about to share with you is absolutely 100% accurate. And if you forget everything else in this talk, if you want to win a rock, paper, scissors, here's how you do it. So the blue team at rock, paper, scissors may say something like, look, We've analyzed the threat intelligence. Winners stick with their actions. So if I won with rock, I'm going to go rock, rock, rock. Uh, losers, losers, they sequentially change. And because they're already primed for rock, paper, scissors, that means I rock, oh, I lost. Paper, oh, I lost. Scissors. So by knowing these two patterns, we can statistically increase our odds of winning. Right? This is a blue team thinking. Uh, red teamers are, by the way, are like, you know what's interesting? Is if I spin paper fast enough, I can cut scissors <laughs> and all of a sudden our entire defense is out the window, right? Wait a minute. What do you mean paper can stop scissors? <sighs> That's what I love about red team. That's what I love about purple team. That creativity is, is so critical. So the process I'm talking about is a way of uh, contextualizing and integrating and improving security, but we still need to be aware that people are going to do crazy stuff. Uh, as another call for help, if you are a red teamer, and you want to talk about being frustrated, uh, I've got a plan in place that looks at adversarial architecture in a city level and applies that to red teamers. I'm looking for some people to collaborate with on a video series or a blog series, so uh, so hit me up. All right, when we get to building these things, are we empathized? Are we going to build? <sighs> Oftentimes, I'm like, hey, what, what's your security capability? And people are like, oh, I've got Nessus, and I've got Aqua. And uh, oh, by the way, we're, I mean, no, 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 not, not the tool, the actual controls. So just to level set everyone about what I'm talking about here, from in this perspective, this would call security capability, uh, a set of mutually reinforcing controls. I like that, right? So um, identity access management could have a uh, single sign-on, strong authentication. Um, it may include privilege access management. May, maybe you got that jump host. Maybe you got a privilege access wear station. Maybe going through credential vaulting. Uh, it could include identity uh, governance, so you're you're doing your automation for onboarding and offboarding. Uh, you get the idea, right? There's a whole set of things that we're doing, technical things. Another NIST definition blows that out. What I like about this one is uh, they include the fact that it's not just the controls themselves. You get the controls, 
implement with a set of tools and run by a set of procedures. Uh, that is really important when we're talking about overall design because any amount of technology we have, useless, useless, if, if it doesn't have people behind it. So what are some examples? You've heard me say a few of them already through this with asset management, configuration management, uh, code management, identity access management, vulnerability management. I know that's a lot of management. That's a lot of management. It is. But hey, you, you're you the one who picked the blue team uh, talk, so uh, you're stuck with me now for the next few minutes. <laughs> the idea here is to pick these controls and figure out which ones work and integrate them in a way that uh, makes sense using design thinking. There is a design process that you can follow, an architectural process, um, by starting with a vision and, and building the business case. Um, you know, What are we protecting, right? Trucks in a shipping company, we talk about the trucks. Mutual funds in a financial services company, we talk about the funds. Um, how is this integrating with the rest of our security? Is it gonna plug into our seam and, and uh, IR functions and everything else? What are those controls that makes up this capability? Uh, what tools are we going to use? Those tools are way late in the game, way late in the game. Uh, and, and how are we going to implement it? So this, this overall process is a process I've been using and advocating for. It follows the, the TOGAF process if you're in an enterprise architecture. Um, and if you're not, just forget I ever said TOGAF. I have been doing a, a blog series on this. So if you are interested, every week I pick out one lesson that picks and places into those areas, feel free to do that. And I've also been doing some uh, some coaching. So about one or two security capabilities a quarter, I've got capacity to, to talk through with people who are building things out. All right, in conclusion, <laughs> design thinking for blue teams. One, uh, we, are, we are designing security capabilities. And these security capabilities, collection of controls and tools operated by people, Security capabilities have to do two things. They gotta get in the way of the adversary. They gotta get out of the way of the end user. Most of the problems we have today is that the security capabilities we build aren't necessarily in the way of the adversary and are ignored or are worked around by our users, which is why I think design thinking is a creative and, and new way of uh, going after this. We design for usability, reducing friction, reducing effort, thinking about the uh, journey map that the user is taking and making improvements along it. We designed for defensibility by creating a similar map using threat modeling for the attacker, uh, finding ways to increase friction, raise those barriers, make it harder for them to do it, reduce the benefits. So maybe they opt to not even go after us at all. This gets to kind of a, a perhaps a controversial statement. I would argue that good security is as little security as possible. Few controls as possible. One, why? Because it's fewer things for people to comply with. So you have a greater degree of likelihood that they will comply. Two, we've seen lots of research now that the amount of downtime that you experience from an outage um, is proportional to how many tools you have, right? Because we've got all these different consoles and trying to put it all together. Um, so simplicity, minimalism. Now, I don't mean ignore security, not saying that, but Good security is as low as security as possible. Security just where it counts. I'll tell you one more anecdote and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, I want to go back to the 1970s, uh, Silicon Valley, right? So imagine 1970s, imagine a, a dapper guy walking around, a little rumpled, he's carrying this briefcase. Like, Why is he carrying this briefcase? This briefcase looks heavy. He's like carrying it up, right? Up to meetings, back onto the street, into the into the taxi. Uh, you're like, what's going on? So this guy is actually a guy named Bill Mogridge. Bill Mogridge um, in the 1970s was trying to figure out how to do mobile computing. And what he did was he bought a suitcase and he put all the parts of a computer in the suitcase. And he would carry them with him throughout the day, put it on the desk, open it up, rearrange them, move them around, getting an intuition for the weight, getting a feel for what it meant to have a portable, uh, getting a sense of where things shifted and, and you know what happened when things were being lugged from elevator to taxi. And uh, and by the late 70s, he had it. He had the design. And if you're watching this on a laptop, you know the design, right? You, you open it up, there's your screen, your keyboard's flat. That design traces back to the 1982 grid compass. The 1982 grid compass was designed by Mel Bulgridge. 
Bill Mowbridge, incidentally, another founder of IDEO. Why do I bring this up? I've uh, been part of MySec for years. I've been coming to Converge for years. I don't necessarily know where all the pieces fit. Right now, I've got an old briefcase, and I'm lugging it around with me, and I'm hoping to, to bring out some innovations. Um, and I would love to have some collaboration, some support. So throughout this talk, I, I mentioned a couple ways to do that. Um, definitely, if you're interested, check out my blog series. Practitioners, I need, I need, I need Super Dave stories. How were Dave's regular users able to work around uh, barriers? How were Dave's regular users able to see benefits of security? If you have a story, please share it with me over Slack, Twitter, or, uh, or uh, whatever works for you. Smoke signals. Blue team, if you want coaching on how to use these principles on designing security capabilities, uh, I'm working with about two organizations a quarter right now. I don't have a lot of capacity, but I'm willing to sit down. And that could be vulnerability management, uh, incident management, identity access management, whatever it may be. So feel free to reach out to me on that. Uh, red team, as I mentioned, hostile architectures, right? This is like 74 patterns to make a city um, hostile. And I want to explore those from a red team perspective. How can we how can we mess with the psychology of a red team? So if you're feeling particularly masochistic, feel free to reach out. I want to do a video series or a blog series on that. And finally, students, if you are doing a capstone or a thesis project, I'd be more than willing to be an advisor on applying psychology to human-centered design and using human-centered design as a way of driving up adoption and security compliance. That's just my opinion, man. I started off with telling you I've been wrong for 10 years. If you want to know more about this, feel free to look at Soups, um, which I referenced a few times here. This is the uh, the annual symposium on uh, usable privacy and security. Uh, design thinking, behavior economics, wayfinding, choice architecture, incentive design, all areas where people are studying this. It's so incredibly important. Um, with, at Cisco, with the security outcome study, we look at what people are doing and how it aligns to the security outcomes. Uh, 4,800 people we talked to recently, over 25 countries. If you look at the activities that have the highest probability of success in reaching the security outcomes, the ones that I'm referring here, well-integrated tech, you need empathy, you need good design for that. Sound security strategy, this is a way to build that strategy where you're looking at adversaries and users. Threat detection, IT and security working together. These are ways that are proven, proven um, to drive the outcomes we need. So I'm feeling pretty good about this. But I also realize that every single time Dave picks up a mouse, right? Every single time the user picks up a mouse, they're making a choice to either strengthen or lessen our security posture. And so in conjunction with all the great tools and technology and advancements we've had in security, uh, we need to start having a similar uh, spurt of innovation on that last part. How do people make those choices and how can we guide and inspire them? Uh, that's it for me. I will stop sharing my screen and open it up for questions if anyone has any. Yep, I just pinged our uh, Discord and our channel here. Uh, we do have a couple of comments. Uh, one in general, this is great material. Uh, it, uh, another user said it's uh, they always dig a little bit of history mixed into presentations. Um, and someone was curious if, you know, having a list of all the projects, links, and resources mentioned, um, if you could put those somewhere, that would be pretty nice. Yes. Yeah, so I am I'm collecting a, a set of references and reading material on my blog. So I'll be continuing to publish that and build that out. Okay. And we have one person typing in Discord right now. So I'll wait to see if they have a question. Then they so I, did this. <laughs> I did this earlier the other day, and people are like, are you doing puppets? I'm like, no, puppets are up here. Typing is down here. Like, yeah. You are weird. I'm like, no, who does pup <laughs> puppets at the keyboard level? That's wrong. <laughs> they're very small puppets. That's all. <laughs> yeah, it's just tiny little puppets. Yeah, they're tiny. Uh, I had to type in again. Give them like 30 more seconds here. Well, while they're doing that, uh, Kyle, and and you know, please pass this on to the entire Converge crew. Thanks again for putting this together. This is this is a fantastic way for us to get together, even if it's just virtual, even if it's just for a little bit. And uh, man, I miss all my MySec folks. So thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. It's, 
It was a lot of fun to put together, a little last minute, but we wanted to get something in before the end of the year, you know, make 2020 a little bit better. Um, so one question that came up is, uh, what podcasts are you in now and working on? Uh, so I don't know if that means podcasts that I am doing or podcasts that I am listening to. Uh, but I'll, I'll answer that both ways. So <laughs> um, Dave, uh, Dave Schwartzberg and I are launching a new podcast called Tactical Security. So that will be uh, arriving here with uh, 2021. 2020 is not a good year to, to drop in. So 2021 Tactical Security, where we walk through specific tactics, uh, that will be available to listen to. Uh, I'm also on the um, uh, Murder Board, which I'm not sure what uh, what that name is. Ah, the Duo Podcast, though. I'm on the Duo one. And then for inspiration in terms of design and whatnot, I love uh, 99% Invisible is great. Um, there is a Detroit Design Podcast, which is phenomenal because we run into a lot of the same people we see at at uh, Converge and at other conferences. So I like the uh, Detroit Design Podcast series. Um, Security Voices is another one that I really like. And Choiceology, which is is periodically updated, but Choiceology really talks to that choice component, right? The choices that people make and how do you give them enough information to make the right choice and do nudges. So some really interesting stuff on Choiceology about, uh, about that. It sounds pretty interesting for them, and that's good. Now, there is uh, a couple of other comments here that we should probably mention on here. One is that people are going to expect in your next presentation to have uh, puppets. Uh, two, they want to know more about the sweater. What about my sweater? Uh, they were just saying, they, they tell me more about that sweater. It, it's warm. It's very, like, warm. I don't know. So the, the thing is, is that I have learned um, in being in my study, which I, if anyone that knows me, I've always been going from city to city and traveling a lot. So being in one place at one time is, is very new to me. And so I've been trying to get my study right and everything. And now it's winter and it is, is I have recognized that there's no heat to my study for some reason. It's very cold. So I've got a, a very warm, slightly cyberpunkish. Uh, sweater and I've got blankets and uh, I am ready to present, but also ready to get heat in about 10 minutes. All right. And I think that'll be it for now. So thank <laughs> you again for presenting and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Cheers.